Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. It's past just past noon in New York City, 5 p.m. in London, 6 p.m. in Vienna, Berlin, Warsaw, and 8 p.m. in Istanbul. This is International Human Rights Day. My name is Will Milberg. I'm the Dean of the New School for Social Research. And I'd like to welcome you all to today's event, which is a tribute to Osman Kavala, who is being honored with this year's Courage in Public Scholarship Award. The award was envisioned in 2014 at the conclusion of our Democracy and Diversity Summer Institute in Wrocław, Poland, by a group of international alumni of the New School for Social Research who are living and working in countries of the larger Europe. They discussed the meaning of the New School academic experience that had shaped their personal and professional lives, its openness to others, intellectual engagement, culture of dare to know, dare to discuss. Guided by the New School's commitment to scholarly excellence, civic engagement, ethical commitment to the larger world, they formed the NSSR Europe Collective, the New School for Social Research Europe Collective, drawing on the ethos of the university in exile, today's New School for Social Research, and the conviction that especially in politically challenging times, universities carry a special social responsibility, the group proposed to establish an annual tribute to exceptionally audacious thinkers, teachers, and doers through an annual Courage in Public Scholarship Award. This year's recipient is Osman Kavala, Turkish publisher, philanthropist, civil society activist, and once long ago, our doctoral student at the New School, who for his work on behalf of cultural dialogue has been held in an Istanbul prison for over four years without a conviction. We have with us a remarkable group of speakers today, beginning with Baroness Helena Kennedy, Arya Nair, Sheila Benhabib, and Michael Ignatieff. I am pleased to give the floor to my colleague, Elzbieta Matinia, Professor of Sociology at the New School for Social Research, Founding Director of the Transregional Center for Democratic Studies and its Democracy and Diversity Institute, who will deliver on behalf of the New School for Social Research Europe Collective, the official citation of this year's Courage in Public Scholarship Award. Ashbieta. Osman Kavala, a Turkish entrepreneur and an advocate for peaceful solutions to deep-seated conflicts, who envisioned ways of bridging divisions, building trust, and thus lessening social despair. Mr. Osman Kavala, since 1980, you have been a practitioner of ideas and a change worker who committed to a just and inclusive society. The life choices you have made from coming to study economics at the New School for Social Research to leaving the world of business behind to seek transformative social change by working within civil society, those choices have framed the four decades of your engagement as a private actor working on behalf of the larger good, public good. Your early decision following the military coup in 1980 in Turkey to take part in the founding of the elitism publishing house was crucial. It brought to the Turkish public major literary works along with books in the social sciences and humanities that helped to alleviate a sense of fear and isolation. Indeed, it was the Elitism Publishing House and other independent publishing initiatives that you launched that helped to maintain societal resilience vis-a-vis -vis the dictatorship and to lay the groundwork for a resurgence of democratic practices and institutions. Three years later, with new elections and the return of democratic rule to, in Turkey, you co-founded organizations and initiatives which by instigating research and discussion on ecological and environmental concerns, on gender and inequality, and on the denial of past atrocities, helped to recast public discourse and reshaped its larger social imaginary. 
your personal engagement in the after, aftermath of the catastrophic 1999 earthquake make you attentive to the related vulnerabilities of both ancient material culture and the current social fabric of communities. Osman Bey, convinced that the language of arts has the potential to bridge cultural, political, and generational divides, and as to mitigate violence, you created an Andalou culture. As Turkey straddles Europe and, uh, and Asia, an Andalou culture has created a thick, flexible fabric of cultural and art spaces that extend throughout the Europe and beyond. It nurtures local artists and their communities, connects them to other regions, embraces refugee communities, and creates collaborative opportunities between West and East. It is this habitat that pushes the boundaries of how one sees the world. It is here that encounter, dialogue, and sustained conversation have found a home. It is here that the exchange of stories and the opening of doors to the worlds of others take place. It is here that Greek and Turkish communities of Cyprus found ways to talk and that Armenians and Turks enter into, albeit uneasy, collaborative projects. The square of dialogue that you help to envision is imbued, as you are, with a sense of responsibility for public matters and a spirit of hospitality and solidarity towards others. The square of dialogue you helped to build with its constructive non-violent violent tensions as uh, Martin Luther King might have put it, inevitably carries performative power. But today, in many parts of the world, it is increasingly silenced and often simply shut down by a widening counter-revolution led by elected authoritarian rulers. Dear Osman Bey, you yourself have paid an extraordinary price for opening up the past and the present and creating an infrastructure for a kind of world we would like to live in. You are widely admired. And as you know, you have many friends and people who love you. We commend your intellectual resolve, your imaginative work, and your persistently high spirits in which you bring us together. I'm pleased to be speaking here on behalf of our NSSR Europe Collective, which is proud to confer upon you 2021 Courage in Public Scholarship Award. I'd like to add that uh, the award itself is a sculpture entitled The Conversation, one between Socrates and Eros, locked in a never-ending attempt to reconcile love and wisdom. Sculpted by a Polish artist, Tadeusz Wodarczak, from Turkish Afyon marble, the award draws its inspiration from the history of Ephesus. It is great honor to have with us today Baroness Helena Kennedy, Labour member of the House of Lords and one of the Britain's most distinguished lawyers. She has spent her professional life giving voice to those who have the least power within the system, championing civil liberties and promoting human rights. She's the founding force behind the establishment of the Bonavera Institute of Human Rights at Oxford University. She has authored a number of books, including two on how the justice system is failing women, and is known for her writings and broadcasts on crucial issues over the years. Currently, as the director of Human Rights Institute at the International Bar Association, she works on upholding the rule of law and human rights globally. Baroness Helena Kennedy. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, and welcome. Thank you for being with us. Elizabeth, oh. I just introduced you to the audience. No, I and I, I heard I heard that lovely introduction, and I do want to thank Elspieta um, for for her kindness um, and uh, and for those very welcoming and lovely remarks. Um, I, um, I I I want you all to know that um, I, I too 
am a huge admirer of, of Osman Kavala. And uh, I, uh, I, in my years um, of uh, practice as a, as a lawyer, um, which is now, next year will be 50 years, um, I, um, I have often worked with Open Society and with Ari Nayers, a wonderful, wonderful uh, hero to me too. And so it was when we were asked if we would do a trial watch for um, the shocking uh, trial of, uh, of Osman Kavala, it was with, uh, it was with great honour that we at the International Bar Association's Human Rights Institute uh, took up that, um, uh, that, that challenge. Um, which was not without difficulties. We did it along with the uh, with the International Commission of Jurists, and uh, and it was shocking that this uh, distinguished uh, human rights um, advocate, uh, this business person of great success, uh, a man who was a, a great believer in democracy and a protector of human rights, um, it was shocking that he had been arrested, and of course um, was arrested and uh, and being charged with having. Um, in some ways, um, incited uh, the demonstrations about uh, the uh, uh, capture of Geyser Park was one of the few uh, places where people could um, enjoy a piece of greenery in the middle of Istanbul, where there are very few green spaces. But it was also, of course, a place where people could publicly, in the public realm, um, protest or demonstrate when uh, governments, uh, the government was doing anything that they um, uh, felt was encroaching upon their freedom as citizens. And so it was for that reason that the state um, in Turkey uh, was closing Geza Park to the public and taking it over. Um, to create a, a security base um, uh, for military and for uh, the security arms of the state. And so um, it was not surprising that citizens um, uh, were appalled that this of this snatching of a piece of green space in the center of the city of Istanbul being taken from them. And so um, many of the uh, organizations which were supported by uh, uh, Open Society, which uh, Osman Kavala chaired and chaired so brilliantly, um, uh, many, many of them received grants from uh, Open Society. And so it was on that basis that they were claiming um, that uh, Osman Kavala was uh, uh, involved in um, uh, breaches of the law and of the, of the criminal code. And it's so interesting that at that time, I do remember that uh, the, the, the woman who had been the director of Open Society in uh, uh, Turkey uh, had managed to flee uh, to the United Kingdom and was here in exile, having uh, uh, sought um, uh, some sort of sanctuary here. And she came to see me to talk about their work and the way in which there had been a framing of Osman Kavala. And, uh, and so it was um, with great honor that we um, collaborated with the International Commission of Jurists to, to uh, watch this trial and to observe it and to report upon it. And it was a travesty. This was no proper trial. This was a, a shocking uh, display of, uh, of using law uh, to, to foul ends and, uh, and really a, a, a way of effecting arbitrary detention on a man who was a, a posed a threat because he stood for all of those things that we care about, uh, those of us who are committed to human rights and democracy in, in our world. And um, I just wanted to, to make it clear that uh, the reports that were created in the observation of uh, Osman's trial um, really displayed uh, the, the bad faith of government um, and of what the Turkish authorities were doing. Uh, he, of course, was being held in, in, uh, in detention, really to take him out of circulation, but also as a, as a lesson to others. It was a way of, of, of creating a chilling effect on wider society. And we know that that has been happening with many others in Turkey, lawyers, journalists, judges, uh, the imprisonment of so many um, who pr pr presented some sort of opposition to some of the appalling things that were happening uh, to the rights of people within, within Turkey. And uh, it was in 2000, and uh, many cases took place, of course, um, involving many of the arrests that had taken place. But with regard to Osman Kavala, after he was arrested in October 2017, um, and of course, the, the allegation of attempting to overthrow the government was just uh, uh, preposterous. Um, 
uh, and claiming that it was he was in some way acting in a way that was preventing the government exercising its uh, its proper function as well. If uh, if taking over the one green space in Istanbul and and uh, and not permitting some kind of protest against that was uh, uh, overthrowing the government or encourage, encouraging in some way. Um, the government, uh, uh, people to prevent the, the government's functioning was was really in a nonsense. But it was um, it was really in with regard to that that an action was then taken to the, eventually to the European Court of Human Rights. And the way that that operates is that you have to um, um, exhaust your remedies within the domestic courts. And so. Um, those remedies were exhausted and it was quite clear there would be no remedy for Osman Kavala within the Turkish uh, court system. And, uh, and so on the uh, uh, 10th of December 2019, the European Court of Human Rights ruled that his detention was unlawful. Uh, it contravened Article 5 of the European Convention of Human Rights. It con contravened um, the, 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 the entitlement of people to a speedy trial because, of course, there was delay after delay after delay and often um, making it impossible for at short notice for people to get to uh, be to conduct the trial watches. Um, and it was in the ruling of the European Court of the European Court of uh, Human Rights that they said that there was clearly an ulterior purpose um, in, uh, and it was to silence um, someone who was a great human rights defender. And th that is what was happening. And it, it's the source of, of, of anxiety for all of us, I'm sure, that as we look around the world, you know, there is the COVID pandemic, but there's another pandemic, which is the, the, the kind of um, spreading of authoritarianism in so many nations around the world and, uh, and the undermining of human rights uh, uh, is now becoming a commonplace and protecting and preserving human rights is even more of a challenge for, for us all. Um, we've recently, again, uh, seen after that ruling um, back in 2019, as you know, um, uh, he was immediately rearrested and, uh, and recharged. And uh, this time, uh, the, the allegation was that he had um, uh, was in fact um, seeking to overthrow the government, um, and uh, and what has also happened is that there has been a merging of his case with a sort of mass demonstration cases, often involving football demonstrators who were upset. I think also in relation to the Giza Park closure, where often um, it was used for for um, leisure purposes by people who were um, keen on football. But I mean, there have been a merging of a whole lot of cases and he has been drawn into that, which of course causes greater de delay um, and injustice for Osman Kavala. Uh, he's been in custody for four years now. And, uh, and only a matter of days ago, on the 3rd of December, uh, the European Court of Human Rights again um, has made clear its position um, that uh, Turkey is now um, failing to implement rulings um, and they have uh, given notice that they're going to start infringement proceedings um, uh, uh, against uh, Turkey. And that was agreed by a two thirds majority. And so uh, um, now the Turkish authorities have until uh, January. Um, the 19th of January is the, the date by which they must um, file a response to that. And, uh, and it does give serious powers. The only time this has been done before was in relation to Azerbaijan. And, um, and in that case, again, there was, a, there was a unlawful detention and it led to the um, release of the, uh, of the detainee. And so we have to just hope and, uh, and hold it to our hearts that, that the European uh, court sticks to its guns, um, that the, the Council of Europe sticks to its guns in, the, in, in extending these, um, uh, uh, these sort of serious um, uh, um, proceedings against Turkey. And that we have to uh, now hope that Turkey sees that um, there is, the, the international community is really uh, standing up against what it is doing. Um, to speak of Osman, it is wonderful that he's receiving this award, and I'm so, I'm so thrilled that he's being honoured in this way, because we need to give sustenance to him in his, in his place in custody. He needs to know that the world out there is watching. He needs to know that um, even beyond Europe, that, that in the wider world, that he is seen as being someone who is a her heroic speaker for truth and for um, the protection of rights. And, uh, and so I really want to add my voice 
in expressing my admiration for him, for his stoicism, for his uh, leadership and for the role that he's played. And uh, I want to thank um, all, all of you who played a role in getting this honour uh, for him. And I want to play, uh, say that I want to um, express my great admiration for Open Society, um, which does such powerful and important work around the world. Um, and so um, uh, we're not living in good times, um, but we must together um, keep our voices loud and clear on the issue of human rights. Thank you. Hello, um, this is Arie Nair. Um, I'm uh, moderating the, um, the panel that is going to uh, talk about the case of uh, Osman Kavala. Um, I'm uh, very glad to be able to do this because we have two very distinguished public intellectuals uh, who are going to speak about the case. Um, I'm uh, moderating this because I'm a lifelong advocate of human rights and uh, also because uh, Osman Kavala uh, is a friend of mine. Um, the first of our uh, panelists is Professor Sheila Ben Habib. Uh, Sheila Ben Habib is a Professor of Political Science and Philosophy Emerita at Yale University and uh, she is now uh, a senior scholar in residence at the Columbia School of Law. Uh, she is the author of many books, the recipient of many awards and of honorary degrees. And uh, among the honorary degrees uh, is one from uh, Bogazici University in uh, Turkey. Sheila Ben Habib, I should say, was born in Turkey and she's a recipient of an honorary degree from a distinguished university in Turkey that has been a particular target of repression uh, during this period 
uh, in which uh, Osman Kavala has been uh, imprisoned in Turkey. Uh, our other uh, panelist is uh, Michael Ignatieff. Michael Ignatieff is a um, former member of the Canadian Parliament. He was the Liberal Party leader uh, in Canada and the leader of the opposition in Parliament uh, in Canada. Uh, he has also been the author of uh, a great many books on a variety of uh, topics and the recipient of many honorary degrees, I believe uh, 13 honorary degrees uh, in all. Most recently, he has served as the um, uh, rector and president of the Central European University uh, uh, and uh, he continues as a professor of history at the C Central European University. So I'm now going to turn this over uh, to Professor Ben Habib. Uh, thank you, thank you. In a, is the sound good? Uh, can you hear me properly? Yeah. Yes. Well, I'm really honored to be participating in this um, event, in this beautiful event. And I also want to give a shout out, not only to Osman uh, himself, but to his wife, Aisha Bura, my classmate, who has also suffered with him this last uh, four years. Osman Kabbala engaged in civil society activism during a period when it was assumed by many inside and outside Turkey that the election victories of the AK party signaled an emancipation of Turkish civil society from the authority of the tutelary bureaucratic and nationalist uh, state that had governed Turkey for decades. Osman advocated embracing the multicultural legacy of the Turkish Republic, the remembrance of a past in which Armenians, Greeks, Kurds, Alevis, Jews, and Circassians left their monuments, their songs, their cuisines, their memories engraved throughout the land. If the French historian Ernst Renan believed that living as a nation meant on doit avoir oublié, one is obliged to have forgotten, Kavala represents that moments in Turkey's past when the democratization of the country would have required the re remembering and coming to grips with its history. For some brief years from 2003 onwards, it seemed as if this is also what the AK party was advocating. But it would soon become clear that the so-called process of civilization, civilishme, in part initiated under the pressure of accession to ca candidacy negotiations with the European Union, was rather a move to remove from the Turkish army all those who would not follow President Recep Tayyip Erdogan's agenda. There were mind-boggling absurdities in the so-called Balios and Ergenekon conspiracies that accused high-level generals in the Turkish army with treason and staged coups. Subsequently, the murder of the Armenian journalist Harant Dink made it clear that the AK party short ride on the train of democracy had come to an end, a phrase used by Erdogan himself. I ride the train of democracy to a certain station and then I get off. Now, the irregularities in Osman Kavala's detention, the charges brought against him and the absurdities of his trials and retrials are a clear indication that Turkey is no longer a country that respects human rights and the rule of law. The preliminary charges uh, brought against Kavala were that, and Baroness Kennedy has gone over this, the vocabulary got very murky. Was it that he aided uh, or abetted? Was he involved in or played a major role in the 2013 Gezi Park uprisings. But added to these charges were supposed, his supposed role in the conspiracies of the Fethullah Gulen organization of December 17 and 25, 2014, and the attempted coup of July 15, 20, 
16. I mean, I think that from any kind of human rights and rule of law perspective, it's clear that this is a smorgasbord of charges. And it's uh, embarrassing the way in which the government kept uh, piling up. Uh, you know that he was arrested on November 1st, 2017, under quite uh, grievous charges of attempting to overthrow the constitutional order through force and violence. But the first indictment against uh, Osman Kavala was issued only a year and a half later on February 19, 2019. Uh, Absurdly enough, the prosecutors sought life imprisonment for Kavala, who was neither an organizer nor a speaker in the Gezi Park uh, protests. And as Baroness Kennedy indicated, it was this circumstantial evidence through Osman's activities in the Open Society Foundation that may have uh, funded some of the groups participating that the courts both, both uh, brought forward. Now, before Osman's lawyers went to the European Court of Human Rights, they had to go to the Turkish Constitutional Court as it is required under the terms of the European Convention of Human Rights. And I want to mention this because the Turkish courts know that they are implicated and involved in a charade. And there are moments of resistance. So here, I want to just mention the Turkish Constitutional Court heard the case and the, in an uncommon 10 to 5 split in the court with Chief Justice Zühtü Arslan siding with the dissenters, dissenters the court ac accepted that there had been no violation of Article 19 of the Turkish Constitution that guarantees the security and liberty of the person, but they felt that there were sufficient grounds to uphold the conviction. By contrast, as we heard, the European Court of Human Rights argued that the Turkish Constitutional Court had not complied with the requirement of speediness in the context of pretrial detentions, Etc., and that it concluded that it had been established beyond a reasonable doubt that the measures uh, complained of in the case pursued an ulterior purpose, contrary to Article 18 of the European Convention of Human Rights, of reducing him to uh, silence. Uh, throughout this more than four years of uh, detention. Kavala has been arrested and rearrested on claims of violent interact in selection, an attempted coup, and acquitted and reacquitted in a perverse series of show trials. The decision of the Turkish government this past fall to expel the ambassadors of the United States and nine other countries for supporting the decision of the European Court of Human Rights calling for Kavala's immediate release sent shockwaves through the diplomatic community. And just think of how extreme this measure is in terms of the response of Turkey uh, to this appeal. And uh, by some diplomatic maneuvers, this was this was avoided. But again, as mentioned by Baroness Kennedy, the European Council of Ministers has, uh, it has been deliberating about which action to take against Turkey. And here we are in a very dangerous moment because the European Court of Human Rights has acted almost as a secondary constitutional court in defending uh, the rights of uh, opposition leaders in Turkey. And so it would be incredible moment of devilish irony, which we are used to seeing from Recep Tayyip Erdogan, if in fact, Turkey accepts to depart from the European Convention on Human Rights in this case. And I personally am quite concerned that that might be a very ironic and almost tragic outcome uh, to this 
uh, to this situation. So to come to a conclusion, whether we call the current regime in Turkey competitive autocracy, because it is still a multi-party system with elections, although many political uh, party heads are, you know, in prison, uh, uh, like Selatin, the, American, the head of the Tur Kurdish uh, People's Party. So whether we call the current regime in Turkey competitive autocracy or populist authoritarianism, such regime types thrive on the creation of internal and external enemies. Kavala is the symbol of an internal enemy that this regime is trying to vanquish, a pluralist, democratic, open Turkey that resists the Islamization of the country, which perverts the language of patriotism also into a form of aggressive nationalism. Kavala represents the aspirations of millions of people in Turkey who want to see the Turkish Republic to be governed by the rule of law and not by the dicta of a man cloaked as law. A republic that is open to the world and at peace with its neighbors. Instead, not only do we have the continuous creation of internal enemies, but also intervention in the Syrian civil war, skirmishes with Turkey's neighbor Greece, conflicts with the US and NATO about the purchase and sale of weapons systems. As Turkey approaches its 100th anniversary on October 29th, 2023, is this the Republic that its citizens can be proud of? And in conclusion, let me remind you of a phrase of Hannah Arendt's halls of oblivion that 20th century regimes uh, and now in our century, also certain regime types have a propensity to create halls of oblivion where individuals on trumped up charges and against human rights and the rule of law can simply be confined to a prison for, for years and years. So the award of this prize is a wonderful act of resistance against those halls of oblivion and saying to Osman that the world has not forgotten you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Ben Habib. Uh, and now, um, Professor Ignatieff. Uh, thank you. Um, it's an honor to be here with uh, Saila Ben Habib and with Arye Nair. Uh, and it's also um, wonderful that the new school is doing this. Um, I vividly remember being at the anniversary of the university in exile decisions that the New School took in the 1930s to give harbor and a new home to German academics who had to flee Nazi Germany. It's a moment of glory in the history of New School, of which it's justly proud. And in addition to that, the New School has taken a lead role with wonderful people like Arian Mack and others, and uh, Will Milberg also uh, in um, supporting the idea of, of um, scholars at risk and scholars in exile. And there are so many of them now, and Osman is one of them, a scholar, not only in exile, but in prison, um, that a new school is, is maintaining a, a a very moving affiliation and continued allegiance to a tradition that is one of the glories of American higher education. So that's the first thing to say. Uh, the second thing to say is just personally, I think we all feel this kind of wish we could just, I don't know, speak directly to Osman and give him a hug, you know, just I, I wish our words could reach into the prison and give him comfort because all I know about prison is it's very lonely. Um, his resilience is astounding. Uh, his courage is uh, an example to us all, but it's lonely as hell and uncertain. He's still in confinement and he doesn't quite know where this endless legal charade will end. And it imposes an enormous strain on his wife, as Sela has pointed out. So the human dimensions of this should be in our mind today as we 
give him an award. I hope he finds out about it. And I hope it gives him a sense that he's not alone and that people care about him and want him out and in tremendously admire the example that he's set uh, for not just for Turks, but for everybody who wants decent um, societies where people are not put in jail in this manner and, and have the freedoms of which Sila uh, spoke just a minute ago. So that's the first thing, just uh, thanks to New School for doing this and enormous admiration for what uh, Osman has stood for over the last four years, not only just as a symbol for people from Turkey, but around the world. Um, a couple of remarks about what this uh, case represents in terms of where we are in terms of human rights in the world. Um, I was very struck listening to Selah's and Helena Kennedy's description of the legal um, nightmare in which Osman is, is entrapped. And notice that this is a an enormously important feature of 21st century authoritarianism. They don't just put you in the slammer, throw away the key. They put you through a legalistic um, process that is a kind of cruel caricature of the law. It looks like law, sounds like law. They use the language of the law, but it has nothing to do with the law. It's pure political arbitrariness using the cover of the law to conceal its true intent, which is to crush um, a courageous dissident whose moral example uh, strikes fear and anxiety in authoritarian regimes. But this contrast between rule of law, what law ought to be, and this legalism. Legalism is, is being shown up here for the fraud uh, that, it, that it truly is. This strikes a very familiar chord to me because when Central European University is thrown out of Budapest by the Orban regime in 2017, they used uh, this exact form of legalism. Uh, the legislation that was passed to get rid of us was looked like law, sounded like law, it went through parliament in a week, but it was a case of piece of pure political arbitrariness masked as law. And this, uh, this aspect of the Osman case is, I think, uh, of much wider uh, uh, influence around the world. Lots of these regimes are doing, are using law in this cynical uh, uh, way to, to hide the pure arbitrary exercise of, of power. Um, Another remark that I would make about this uh, is that we have to look squarely at what uh, Erdogan's um, defiance of international opinion is telling us about the state of the world. It's really something when he throws uh, 10, I think it's 10 ambassadors out of his country because they dare to make a comment about the international human rights implications of of a domestic action. It's really something when um, someone who has been part of the European legal architecture uh, for a long time uh, simply uh, sets the European Court of Human Rights at defiance and sets the um, Council of Europe at defiance. Uh, that signals the ways in which Erdogan has simply abandoned any uh, expectation of ever um, getting into Europe or even desiring to be in Europe. Um, his, his indifference to international pressure here uh, from NATO allies, from trading partners is a very significant and uh, worrying uh, development. Um, he is either drastically over exaggerating his power and his capacity to um, uh, control his domestic circumstance, um, or he's making a catastrophic strategic mistake and only time will tell. But when I look at what I'm seeing here, I'm, I'm seeing something that has much wider implications than just Turkey. Um, 
And that is, there's, I think, a crisis of the universal that we need to speak about honestly. A universal principle has been violated in the detention of Osman Kabbalah, the, the simple, basic rights to uh, due process, um, the scandal of holding someone for four years without a trial. These are some of the oldest legal principles enshrined in international human rights law. But there's a crisis of the universal in the sense that with the proliferation of regimes like Erdogan and Orban is another example, and Xi Jinping is a bigger example still, and Vladimir Putin still another, and then I could go around the table and we can all add up a very large list of authoritarian regimes. Um, these are regimes that are contemptuous of international sanction and international reproof to a degree that is, um, I think, a new phenomenon. They feel the wind is at their back. They feel history is on their side, not on the side of liberal democracy and universal human rights. And I think on our side, and I'm an old human rights defender, much less distinguished than Helena Kennedy or Selah Habib, or certainly not Arya Nair, but I'm in the, count me among the troops. What I see is um, that our narrative uh, is in trouble. Our narrative was that human rights um, comes out of the French and American revolutions. It comes out of the Christian universalism. It comes out of the universalism in many other religious traditions. And it's been on the march for 200 years. And slowly, incrementally, bit by bit, that universalism will triumph. Well, I just think we have to have a much more tougher-minded view of the history that we're part of here. Um, history, as Isaiah Berlin used to say, um, quoting Alexander Herzen, history has no libretto. History is not singing the song of freedom. Uh, the, there is no guarantee that uh, human rights is going to tri triumph in the future. There is every possibility that we're in for a very long period of steady consolidation of authoritarian rule. Um, and that poses, a, 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 it means, I think, not. You might think I'm pushing you towards despair and hopelessness and detachment and resignation. I'm not. I'm just saying what I think someone like Osman Kavala has known, that Martin Luther King knew, that Václav Havel knew in prison. History is made by what we do. History is made by what we are prepared to fight for and endure. Um, and the endurance here is, I think, very important. Uh, one of the things that is Erdogan has, I think, seen in Osman Kavala is an absolutely unexpected capacity to endure and not to bend and not to break. And that's a power in itself. Um, I think Osman Kabbala has understood history is not on his side. The only thing he's got is endurance. And I think this is a lesson that we've seen recurrently. We saw it with, with um, uh, Mandela. We saw it with Havel. We saw it with Martin Luther King. This capacity to absorb punishment, to take punishment and never give up, never give in. Um, I don't want to sentimentalize it because as I said a minute ago, there is nothing tougher than doing time in prison. But what is happening here is that Osman Kavala has shown by his determination that he is an implacable force. And this is a political fact for Erdogan. And so I, we're not just saluting his courage, we're saluting the ways in which endurance translates into political power. And that's a real historical lesson through the, through the last uh, 30 years. And uh, I do believe that that uh, endurance, that intransigence um, is, uh, uh, an extraordinary example of the ways in which we can inflect history with sufficient determination. I've gone in longer than I intended because I'm moved by this moment and um, want to affiliate myself so strongly with what has been said today. And I hope we can have a bit of a discussion. Thank you so much.
Thank you very much, Michael, and thank you very much, uh, Shayla. Um, I, I want to pick up uh, on Michael's reference uh, to 21st century uh, authoritarianism. Um, I think that um, one of the um, characteristics of a previous period uh, is although there were, uh, there was great repression in many countries, um, it looked as though uh, things were going in the right direction and that over time uh, that repression would uh, diminish. And uh, a dismaying feature of uh, 21st century authoritarianism uh, is that things seem to be going uh, in the wrong direction. Um, when uh, the AK party came to power and uh, Erdogan uh, became prime minister, uh, I was one of those who uh, thought that this was uh, a new day uh, for Turkey and that Turkey would become uh, a, um, a country that respected human rights. Um, torture was uh, very sharply reduced. Uh, there was an opening uh, so far as publishing was concerned. And uh, along with a colleague, um, I uh, took the initiative to create uh, a body called the Independent Commission on Turkey uh, which consisted of prominent Europeans uh, to assist in Turkey's effort uh, to become a member of the European Union. Uh, it seemed to us that having a large, predominantly Islamic country as a member of the European Union and a country that also respected human rights uh, would be a great thing. And so we enlisted uh, Marty Atasari, who was uh, formerly the president of Finland and a Nobel Peace Prize winner uh, to chair this body. And we uh, enlisted people like Albert Rohan of uh, Austria and Emma Bonino of Italy and um, Michel Ricard of France and other prominent Europeans uh, to serve as members of this independent commission uh, on Turkey. And they met with Erdogan uh, many times uh, as part of their effort to, um, to help Turkey become a member of the European Union. Uh, but things have gone in the, the wrong direction. You referred to Xi Jinping, uh, you referred to Putin, uh, you referred to, uh, to Orban, um, and you said there are many others that one could add to that list. And uh, indeed there are uh, many others that one could add to that list. Um, what, what can one say about this uh, apparent uh, trend in the wrong direction um, that uh, has increased authoritarianism uh, in the, uh, the 21st century. Is, is there uh, some common feature uh, to the uh, deterioration that has uh, taken place? Sheila Ben Habib uh, discussed uh, the many uh, flaws of the uh, judicial process uh, that um, uh, has taken place in Turkey, and she discussed uh, the quandary uh, about um, what the uh, Council of Europe ought to do about um, uh, the case of Osman Kavala, because the Council of Europe has launched infringement proceedings, and they will take a while, um, but the ultimate uh, consequence of those proceedings could be the expulsion of Turkey from the Council of Europe. And yet that would probably harm uh, many persons uh, in Turkey who look to the Council of Europe um, and the European Court of Human Rights uh, for some succor when they are um, being persecuted in the, uh, the courts of Turkey. So do we have a strategy um, for dealing with such matters? And uh, can we say uh, what has been behind this, um, uh, this increase in authoritarianism of the 21st century? Michael, do you want to uh, try and take that? And, and then I'll go to Sheila. Uh, I'm glad you've asked such a small technical question. <laughs> that I, and it just, um, look, we're dealing with a, um, a wave which has many different causes. I, I know a little bit about the Hungarian case, much less 
about the Turkish case, and we'll defer to Shayla about the, the Turkish case. Um, the thing that troubles me, which you haven't mentioned, is the ways in which our democracies are um, so weak, so divided, so polarized, so unable to set the kind of moral example and political example of effectiveness that would begin to pull uh, authority away from these authoritarian regimes. I think that's a dimension of this that we need to be honest about, which is it's not simply that they're rising. There's some deep way in which we're falling. And um, um, I, I noticed just in my dealings with Orban in Hungary that uh, the European Union was just absolutely incapable of uh, enforcing basic principles of academic freedom and uh, rule of law in that part of the world. Well, you know, and Hungary is a nominal democracy and is a member of this outfit. You know, Turkey isn't even in the club yet, and yet they weren't able to do anything effective with Hungary. So my sense of here is, uh, my sense of the problem is, you know, on the one hand, you'd have to explain the, you know, the mounting prestige of authoritarianism. Um, and you tell a story about they make the trains run on time and they get everybody vaccinated and they, you know, they um, deliver basic uh, social goods. You know, th that would be a kind of story you tell. But the, the real story to me is, is the, the weakness of our democracy that Mr. Biden had a summit of democracies uh, yesterday by um, uh, you know by by zoom it was not a very impressive spectacle um, uh, we've got to get our house in order and and it's it's um, and until we do um, it is extremely easy for people like Erdogan to say I don't I don't need to take any lessons from you people um, and, and that, it seems to me, is the one, one thing I would add to this. Uh, but I'll hand over to Shayla, who may have more intelligent and interesting things to say. Shayla, oh. <laughs> would you comment? Gosh, these are such big and difficult questions to um, follow on one point that Michael uh, is making, as you may know, the last you know, um, five, six years of political science literature in this has been dominated by titles like the death of democracy, how can democracy survive? So we are also in the midst of a crisis in our own house. And um, what, what is behind these uh, convulsions? And um, undoubtedly this, uh, what's been referred to, you know, um, as a neoliberal economic globalization is part of this picture in a very, very big way because it has uh, weakened uh, the nation state's distributive, redistributive capacity. And this weakening of redistributive capacity has uh, created enormous, you know, uh, gaps. I mean, we know from economists that worldwide uh, poverty gaps have diminished because of China's and India's entry into the world market. Whereas if you look at a country like the United States, uh, it, you know, uh, inequality has increased uh, in the last two, in the last two decades. Turkey is part of this mix that, it, it, that access to the world market together with Erdogan's Islamist redistributionism, if I may just invent a term that I haven't used before, has really helped um, the uh, small town folk, the, um, let's say, a, a farmer who owned, let's say, three to five acres of land, they have improved their class status. They have become part of a, uh, bourgeoisie, uh, these people are um, pious. I don't want to call them Islamist, but they are pious Muslims. 
and they are Erdogan's support base. And um, the urban, uh, um, uh, there are urban groups also that have benefited tremendously uh, from Turkey's um, open access to the world market. I mean, one thing about Turkey is that it's a very rich country in resources and it's a, it's a big country with its own internal market. And the current um, world situation, sorry, I find myself talking about political economy here, but the current world situation is so confusing that look at what ha was happening to the Turkish lira uh, last week. And then Turkey signs 15 agreements with the king of Qatar. And then all of a sudden, the value of the Turkish lira changes. So this is the multipolar world. And uh, I think in the multipolar world, uh, there are um, ways in which authoritarian regimes know how to cooperate with one another. And in that sense, Erdogan is a very interesting player because if the United States upsets him, he immediately calls Putin up, he goes to China, and China, of course, is bailing out even a country like uh, Greece in certain ways. So we are dealing with a very complex world political economy, plus the, the decline of um, influence of the United States because of the rise of authoritarianism in, in our own uh, a country. So this is, um, this is a, a picture uh, where uh, I, th I think um, it, it's in some ways quite, quite unprecedented. And uh, I'm very struck by Michael's uh, philosophical phrase, and I'll have to think about this. I like this phrase, the crisis of the universal. I think that that is really uh, that is really at a deep level, a very very compelling, uh, compelling phase. Joining the world neoliberal global market does not mean respecting universal human rights. They mm -hmm. just don't go together, and this is a lesson that we are learning. I don't know how we can prevent. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm going on a little too long, but let me just please go on. I just want to say one thing. How can we prevent um, Erdogan just basically saying to the European um, Court of Human Rights, okay, this is what you want. You've put me up against the wall. I walk out. Are there forces in Turkey who would argue against this? I think there are. I think... There is a strong professional honor among Turkish judges and lawyers and um, some sectors of the military, I think among uh, academics who resist and resist the encroachments and the uh, 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 suffering that they have been, uh, that has been brought upon them. I think, uh, doctors, uh, you know, and an extremely a diasporic, good academic community. So I don't believe that this will go without any resistance, but I think maybe one has to know how to, how to try to appeal and make inroads into this, what I call the sense of sort of professionalism and a kind of professional uh, professional honor that's so, so important in, in Turkey. Um, Professor Ben Habib, you, you uh, uh, referred to the difficulty uh, of uh, whether to, um, uh, or how the Council of Europe uh, ought to uh, react to, to this situation. I think it's uh, Article 90 of the Turkish Constitution which requires Turkey to um, uh, uh, defer to the um, judgments of international treaty bodies, such as the Council of Europe. And so in failing to follow the, um, the order of the, of the European Court of Human Rights to release Osman Kavala, Turkey is violating its own uh, constitution. Uh, 
but for the Council of Europe, uh, this presents a, a difficult problem because if they go forward uh, with this infringement proceeding, uh, they could end up suspending uh, Turkey or expelling uh, Turkey from the, uh, the Council of Europe. And is that something that would be uh, harmful or is that something that would be helpful? It seems to me a very difficult question. In my opinion, it would not be helpful. In my opinion, it would not be helpful. And I do hope that some other solution uh, can be uh, can be found. And my own reading of Erdogan's psychology is that uh, he is extremely agile in finding alternatives just when you think his back is against the wall. So I believe there has to be a, a way in which this could possibly be brought to some resolution while he can save uh, face. Mm -hmm. um, would he accept Osman receiving an offer of asylum from a European country? There are many, many brilliant Turkish journalists who have received asylum offers from European countries who are there, you know, I'm just, would this be, would this be a possibility? Would this be a possibility? But here I'm thinking of something that Michael said, that endurance is Osman's strength. And I don't think Osman ever thought of himself as someone like, uh, you know, Martin Luther King or Mandela. He's just been put into the situation, but he has shown an incredible backbone and stoic resistance. So diplomatically, is there a way to get Osman out of prison while also you know, having Erdogan's safe face for another couple of years or something, you know, hoping that the Turkish people get rid of him in due course. So Martin just... Luther King and, and Mandela were leaders of protest movements. Osman was never uh, the leader of a pro protest movement. He was a philanthropist um, aiding um, cultural expression in Turkey and um, a concern particularly with, uh, with minority rights uh, in uh, Turkey. But I don't think he ever thought of himself as the leader of a movement. Um, uh, the fact that he has become the victim uh, of this kind of persecution is uh, not something uh, he could have anticipated. Uh, Mandela and, and Martin Luther King, uh, I think were in a very different category than, uh, than Osman Kavala. I think that's true, but I, and I, I, I <laughs> and it, it's not helpful to categorize him that way because that increases his political difficulties with Erdogan. I was simply making the different point that over four years, I think a certain iron has gone into his soul and, and his endurance has become a political fact uh, that I think is a source of strength to him, but it's also, it's a, it's also poses a problem for Erdogan in terms, of, um, in terms of letting him go because he's, he's shown such courage that even if he didn't want to be a symbol, he's it become a symbol. The, to me, it looks point. like personal vindictiveness uh, on the, uh, the part of Erdogan. He was acquitted uh, and then uh, walking out of the court and rearrested yes. on entirely uh, different grounds. And that looks as though uh, there was a personal vendetta uh, against Osman by, by Erdogan. Yeah. I'm a little surprised by the ways in which we focused almost entirely on Europe being the only work place where the lever leverage can be exerted. And I, um, I, I don't think we should forget the United States. I mean, they're, they have very strong bilateral ties through NATO. I'm very skeptical that um, Europe will go to the lengths of expulsion or even suspension. Uh, I think they, um, uh, the, the record of the European community actually enforcing legal judgments here is, is so 
it, it's just clear to me they're 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 not going to uh, go there. It may be, in fact, that the best chance of getting them out is just very very quiet um, multi-track diplomacy uh, that allows Osman to get up to accept a a position somewhere in Europe or somewhere in the United States, uh, and it all. Uh, but I, I, I suspect that uh, that's, that's also going to be very, 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 very difficult. Yeah. Um, Arya, we have really, among friends, uh, Turkish friends and so on, we have often raised this question about a personal vendetta because it has reached a point of international embarrassment. Uh, truly, and um, you know, one has been asking oneself why, with as you mentioned, why would someone without a social movement uh, behind him uh, uh, being uh, um, uh, confined in this way? And uh, absurdity of the charges against him. I think this is known, you know. Uh, by quite a few, quite a few um, people. I mean, the Turkish public sphere is very active, and there is quite a lot happening. So, I think part of the my analysis of the internal enemy, okay, the creation of an opponent of the regime, upon whom the exercise of power augments your own power. I think that that is the that is the the side the psychology there is also a kind of you know there is a turkish uh, word that's very hard to translate the phrase is gözda vermek it is like it's almost as if you you uh, you challenge someone's courage uh, you intimidate them by setting them a kind of by showing them the mountain almost and um, is, since Erdogan himself is a very folkloric character or a character who is also very close to some of the top tropes of Turkish cultural history, you know, it's as if um, he is, yeah, this man is, is an example uh, of what can happen, what would, uh, what would uh, happen. So, uh, there, it's a certain way of exercising power. And it's both, you know, I think Michael was saying it's both generalizable and it's also very, maybe it has this dimension of a kind of Turkish authoritarianism that comes from the legacy, you know, um, of the Sultan or something, you know, it's just, but it, it, truly we have often wondered about about the the uh, the political psychology behind uh, behind this whole behind this whole affair. I think that's a very important comment. Um, uh, I think trying to understand the motivation uh, of the uh, the Turkish government and Erdogan in individually uh, in holding uh, someone like Osman uh, as a prisoner. Uh, is very important to, uh, to efforts to try to, to free him. Uh, my own view uh, is that um, ultimately we're not going to be able to diagnose um, uh, Erdogan, um, but uh, that uh, events like this uh, in which we demonstrate that uh, in prison for more than four years, uh, Osman is not forgotten that he is uh, celebrated um, uh, by um, uh, people in different parts of the world, uh, that the, um, uh, the uh, liberal um, thinkers uh, in the United States and in other countries uh, remain very much concerned with Osman is really the, the most we can do and the best we can do uh, in trying to um, uh, secure his release. Obviously, we have to pursue the um, uh, the legal remedies such as they are, um, but um, Erdogan is intent on uh, defying the, um, uh, the rules uh, that apply uh, in such matters. 
And so just making um, certain that uh, Osman is not forgotten, that he is um, uh, high on the, um, the agenda uh, of those concerned with rights worldwide uh, is a critical part of the effort uh, to try to, uh, to free him uh, from prison. I think we're, we're running out of time. Uh, I think this has been uh, an immensely interesting uh, discussion. Uh, Professor Ben Habib, I want to thank you uh, very much for taking part in, in this uh, discussion. Um, uh, Michael Ignatieff, I want to thank you uh, for your participation in this discussion. I'm sorry we didn't get Helena Kennedy uh, back to take part uh, in this discussion, but I think uh, the efforts that she is engaged in through the International Bar Association and through the effort to secure legal remedies uh, is uh, a critical part of the effort uh, to try to end uh, Osman Kavala's uh, very long imprisonment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ariyev. Thank you, uh, Sheila. Thank you very much, Michael. Uh, I wanted to add um, for the end uh, one one contribution among Osman Kavala's closest collaborators were artists. And we have we, we didn't have anybody sitting with us today. Um, but I'd like to share with you the voice of one of them. Muratan Mungan is one of the most prominent writers in today's Turkey, a playwright, a poet, an essayist. And here is a letter. He, just, he wrote a letter to Osman Kavala on one of his birthdays in prison. October 1st, 2019. Dear Osman Kavala, what does one say to somebody on his birthday when it is the 700th uh, day of his life spent behind bars for no reason? The repetition of tyranny in this country's history, though the content and kind may change, grinds down our lives and corrodes our speech. Best to keep it simple. Happy birthday. Many in this country have experienced the cycle of tyranny in the past and in the present. They have seen it and learned from it. One way or another, everyone has had their share and continues to. Yet their numbers have not been exhausted. I'm not saying anything you do not know, you do not already know, and I don't know how much comfort it can give you while confined within four walls. Still, I want to say this. The rule of tyranny only unfolds in the, pres in the present tense. All over the world, official history is brief. History generates a kind of exchange. Out of this present time that uh, they are stealing from you, they try to create a timeless tense. Maybe they think they have established a logia of time and can rule the era, but they cannot put themselves into a timeless tense. Time itself also has four walls, and it's they who are imprisoned there. What's real is history and the memory of the other. I would like to keep it timeless. The contribution of highest value that you have made to this country in all humility have long since found their place in the memory of others. The actions you have taken, your efforts, your contributions have long since made you an asset to this country. As you know, what they try to wrest away from you and from others in your situation is not really your time. It is that which, despite all their power and position and wealth, they cannot never possess, dignity. Because dignity is an asset of life that fans out from the present into timeless memory. It is earned, indeed, with, the, with time and patience, but it is very easily lost. It is something no one can take from you unless you lose it yourself. Four walls are not enough to hold you captive. May your birthday remind you of the ever-living signature you have put into to your life, not, not of the four walls where you are confined. Let me brief, be, be, let me be brief. When you get out, we'll have tea in Gezi Park. Promise? 
Morathan Munkan. I want to thank you, everybody. I want to thank you uh, here and people in Europe and people in Turkey, uh, in Istanbul, in Ankara. Thank you very much. Good afternoon and good night. Thank you. <laughs>